I didn't have a Sasa, or a, I think Sasha would be better if you put the H before the A. I would think about that very seriously. <laughs> um, so objective one, building on the legacy. So the ballet school talent is the sole entry criterion. So everyone's tuition is geared to their income. So if you have no income and you have a talented child, they're in the ballet school for free. Um, that's been the long running uh, founding principle that we were adhering to Celia Franca, who I think I, told, I don't even tell the story tonight. Celia Franca, who founded the ballet school and the ballet company in 1951 and 1959, when she came to Canada as a dancer at first, worked at Eaton's as a sales clerk and paid dancers out of her sales clerk strategy to find their, their salary to find the national, found the national Ballet of Canada. So again, you know, in terms of legacy, incredible stuff in terms of entrepreneurial. Um, for us, really, really important that students are fully funded. So the big story of that year was uh, Sipe, who's the middle of the photo here, who was one of nine kids from South Africa. Um, by fluke, a Canadian music teacher was volunteering in his uh, village and found this super talented young kid, videotaped him, and a couple months later he was at the ballet school on a full scholarship, which was a pretty remarkable story. He was in the Nutcracker, I think, actually that December. So he went from like abject poverty in South Africa to the stages of the National Ballet of Canada, which is a pretty incredible story. Area two for us, and this is the way to innovate when you have no money. Uh, we partnered with a lot of filmmakers and digital media producers and we didn't have the capacity, the motion capture studios and so on to produce anything, but we worked with others who did, um, particularly young talent. So Ryan Enns Hughes, who's on the top left, uh, but a 24-year-old photographer, now quite renowned, worked with us to develop a bunch of digital content we could then disseminate on Vimeo and YouTube. Uh, the motion capture you see at the bottom was pretty fantastic in terms of freeze image. And then we did a bunch of flash mobs uh, which we're going to break out into later tonight. No, we won't. <laughs> <clears throat> that would have been something, actually. I should really do that. Um, so flash mob content as well, which is fun, and I'll come to that further in a second. Area three, cultural entrepreneurship. So we wanted to make sure that dancers leaving the school had skill sets other than just dancing. And we've had famous graduates like Azure Barton, who's in the red dress there, leave the ballet school, leave ballet, create her own dance company. In her case, she's a, a dancer who was raised in Edmonton, who's now artist in residence at the Baryshnikov Arts Center, running her own company. So we brought people like her back and said, how did you do it? And could you share that story with the, with the students? Uh, which she did. And we actually had the students produce a bunch of shows fe uh, featuring her company. I took a, one of the young dancers out on his first fundraising call as well, which was very cute. Um, so helping facilitate not only marketing, promotion, but uh, some of the fundraising. Um, on the right side, creative venture. So this was something that was uh, hard for my board to wrap its head around. We, uh, we decided to create a young patrons council. Now you may remember earlier in the conversation, I sounded not very enthusiastic about these things. So we talked about, we talked we met with a bunch of the young patrons that we had around the institution and said, what do you want to do? And they all said, much like the group we saw earlier today, they wanted to make a difference. They wanted to do something where they moved the needle in some meaningful way. And at this point, our operating budget was about $22 million per year. And most of these, these young students and early professionals could afford to give us a couple hundred dollars, which honestly was not that meaningful. Like, it's important money, but wasn't really um, game changing. So we created a thing, and I have to give credit to Stephen Delaney, who's a young business leader, aspiring maybe potential mayor or prime minister in Toronto. Um, he took the lead on this and built a collective where we at the ba BAM Center, or Bell BAM Center, Ballet School, supported um, our young patrons in their efforts to fundraise for other dance organizations. So again, you know, further to the slide where there's the incumbent and the new entrant, we focused on new entrants, smaller dance companies where that $200 donation would actually be important and spent all of our time mentoring these young patrons so they could help build a more robust dance ecology in Toronto. Um, I did have to, I think I went through three board meetings trying to explain this because, you know, for a not-for-profit to set up a fundraising endeavor to help other not-for-profits raise money was a bit sketchy in their minds. Um, it's now raised, I think, about half a million dollars for small dance companies across Toronto. So pretty robust in terms of change um, and remarkable work being funded there. And also something that really a lot of these young patrons have now gone on to be founding board members. Stephen, the young man I mentioned, to create a venture, is now 25. And in addition to doing that, he chaired the um, Ballet School's Gala last year. So in addition to being an important player in this, he's now stepping up and taking on senior leadership roles as a board member at the National Ballet School. 
um, the very sexy building cultural participatory infrastructure. We did something that was quite controversial back in its day. We partnered with So You Think You Can Dance Canada. So for any of you that know dancers, when So You Think You Can Dance came to Canada, it was the enemy. It was crass, it was commercial, it was the opposite of what the fine arts community espouses as values. Um, that changed when it, became, oops, when it became the most popular show in Canada, 1.1 million people at one point watching it per week. So we watched the show and said, okay, there's something missing from this show. And that missing piece is a call to arms or some sort of enabling vehicle that could take people off the couch and get them more actively engaged in the dance community. So we built a website called wanttodance.ca where we went coast to coast to coast. We registered 1, 100, over 1,100 students or studios and created an online community of 750,000 dance students. So this was a very um, inexpensive investment. I think it cost us about $40,000 to build the platform, but it suddenly took this ballet school out of Toronto and really created a national relevance in terms of our community and connections. In addition, we ran a retail store and e-commerce outlet, so in addition to enabling people to get involved in the dance community locally all across the country, we were also able to enable um, retail sales through some of these dance schools in a way that was beneficial to the ballet school. So that was kind of neat. This next slide was something that I got a lot of credit for and was a complete accident. Not the slide itself, but what I'm going to tell you about the accident wasn't, uh, wasn't the slide. Um, when we did this flash mob to celebrate the 50th anniversary, our partner was the Arts and Crafts record label. Leslie Feist was the artist. We created this great piece featuring Matt Mrozewski, who's shown in the video at the top left there. And what we were finding was we had 350 dancers, and from week to week, people were forgetting the dance. When I say people, I'm talking about me, um, but many others who were in it as well, although I was probably the worst offender. Um, so we created a series of online videos so that people could go home and practice with the video and make sure they weren't mislearning the dance. So we had this great performance at the Eaton Center on International Dance Day, April 29th. The fountain at the Eaton Center was choreographed into the piece. It's quite beautiful. Uh, it was great. About a, I guess it was two months later, I get an email from the Regional Executive Director of Canadian Heritage saying, you guys are amazing. And now I don't typically get that kind of an email from people, particularly with no context around it, although I'm delighted to hear it. And if you're inspired tomorrow to send me that note, I'd grab it or see that email. Um, so I replied and said, I, thanks, I have no idea what you're talking about. And she had gone to her daughter's public school, and one of the teachers, who was not a dancer, had been in our 350 uh, dancer experiment, had taken the videos back to the public school and had taught the whole public school this flash mob which was something we hadn't thought of at all. And in fact, we were gearing up to do another flash mob and we thought, oh, a light bulb went on for us. And we said, well, maybe instead of creating the flash mobs, our job as Canada's National Ballet School is to build a series of online videos using Canadian choreographers, Canadian music, that every public school could then use for free and upload their own content. So we've now done, I think, five of those and we have dancers every year all across the country that are using that content, which is pretty amazing. And you, in fact, can stage your own flash mob with that content if you so choose. So that's just, again, that was a total accident, and we basically ended up building a sort of national approach to dance education that was pretty substantive around what was a complete accident experiment. On to the BAMP Center. By show of hands, how many of you have been to the BAMP Center before? Good, come back, it's good, it's beautiful. For those of you that haven't been there, you should come. As I mentioned earlier, it is the largest arts and creativity incubator in the world. We have tested that. 4,000 artists, 13 different artistic disciplines, 97 different programs, uh, 2,000 mathematicians, 2,000 business leaders. Um, part of my challenge, to be honest, is co-creating the future of the BAM Center. So what you probably heard me say around the ballet school and the conservatory is I do a series of listening tours. I have 530 staff at the BAM Center. Um, last spring, I met with all of them in 33 subgroups, uh, 33 meetings of 90 minutes each, which is a lot of time. I will tell you, even in meeting number 33, we were still getting new ideas we hadn't heard. So you'd think after you know, sort of 10 meetings with staff, that would be it, but no, great ideas coming up right to the end. So what I'm gonna show you in terms of our direction is really the pro byproduct of co-creating this vision with my entire team. Um, also with you, so when I ask you about the BAMP Center and who's been there and you show your 
show your hands, I think that's important. As you hear me present today, if you want to send me or give me your feedback later tonight, I'm happy to receive it because it's really important for us at the BAMP Center that we are driving this institution as high as it can possibly go, and the more people we have involved in terms of voices and creativity, the better. So, in this case, our mission statement was only two words, inspiring creativity, which actually does resonate with most of the staff. I'm not totally sold on it, but it's not really about me, it's about what works for everybody else, so that works for them. Um, in terms of the four key elements for us, they're around access, redoing our leadership development, artistic excellence, and capital renewal. Uh, we did get into this conversation earlier. The uh, BAM Center was born in 1933 of the Extension Division of the University of Alberta. And back then the philosophy was that big ideas should not be kept in the ivory tower, that big ideas should be shared with everybody. So what that meant in the 20s and 30s was a number of faculty, including our founding, uh, founding fathers of the BAMP Center um, from the U of A, driving across rural Alberta and doing lectures wherever they could gather people to really share big ideas with the masses. So we're trying to capture that spirit and also look at how we might uh, transform the world through leadership development programming and ensure that artistic and creative excellence is funded at the highest possible level. So this is my take of the performing arts ecology in Canada. So at the bottom of this pyramid, can you read this okay with the color scheme? Yeah, it's okay. Bottom of the period, we have arts education. So we have public school arts education, K to 12, and community arts education. So community arts education would be all the dance classes, music lessons, parks and rec programs that hopefully you have access to in your community. In a perfect world, everybody has access to that type of programming. Um, adults, early childhood, right through on the community arts education side, and every kid in the K-12 system should have access to arts education. We've become hyper fixated on creativity, imagination, innovation in our society, and the fact that we have a very fractured, broken arts education system in our public schools is a disaster. Assuming that wasn't the case, though, every student would move through that bottom level and would become creative citizens. Most of those people would become actuaries and dentists and academics and lawyers and whatever, um, as long as they had a sense of creativity amongst them. A few people, like myself, disappoint their parents greatly by deciding to become professional artists. So we move into that next layer up, the second layer up, which is arts training institutions, universities and colleges. Some artists are self-taught as well. In the arts training space, we have 36 national arts training institutions. In universities and colleges, we have about 140 fine arts programs in Canada. So we have about 170 arts training institutions. One might say that's too many. Certainly, one could say they should be coordinated. So the notion that we would have 170 institutions all training professional artists and not coordinating their work is a bit strange. Um, to give you a sense of how unusual Canada is in this space, in European countries, and I'll talk about opera because that's my background, there will be one or two large opera schools in the country. In Canada, we have four opera schools in Toronto. So we have a proliferation of these institutions, and what ends up happening is they're all underfunded to some degree and therefore not as globally competitive as they should be. So we do need to coordinate that better. Again, assuming that works, people become professional artists. And at that stage, they do one of two things. Normally, they wait for the Magical Arts Council grant. Um, the bad news is often that Arts Council grant does not ever arrive. So it's a long wait. Um, or they incubate. And the incubation zone, the third tier up, is where we step in at the BAM Center. We work with professional artists and give them opportunities in terms of developing digital media products arts management training, cross-disciplinary approaches. And so that's really the band we fit into. And then from there, hopefully artists get into regional, national, and the global market. So the reason we use this slide is one, to explain where the BAMP Center fits into this. Um, two, to also talk about not only the BAMP Center, but other institutions, what tends to happen with our sector and with not-for-profits in general. We don't have enough money, so we diversify into other parts of the system. So I think BAMP Center's case, or an incubator, but we became a regional presenter as well as an arts training institution. And what ends up happening when you do that is you dilute the focus and move into parts of the model where you just can't add value. So in our case, we do 460 events a year at the BAMP Center. By being a regional presenter, what we do is every now and then Blue Rodeo or some band will travel by BAMF and they'll stop at the center and do a concert. Now, in our minds, that's not the business of the BAMP Center. The business of the BAMP Center is uh, creating new content, or at least ensuring that all of the artists involved are mentoring new artists, new creative approach and practice. 
So really, really important that we refine our focus and sort of stay in that zone as an incubator. And it is actually the distinctive place that the BAMP Center fits in Canada. I was really long-winded, I'm sorry about that. Um, so in terms of our access priority, um, we've got a content capture and dissemination strategy on the walls of the Eric Harvey Theatre at the BAMP Centre inscribed the words made in BAMP shared with the world. So that is the sub tagline for us in content dissemination. What we are doing in this space as an institution is we're working with the CRTC first to acquire three radio stations, English, French and full commercial broadcast license. Um, so we will watch BAMP Centre Radio, it will be 90% Canadian content, all content developed at the BAMP Centre, directly connected to the BAMP Centre in some way. We have the man who ran CBC Radio 2 running that radio stream, and our new Vice President of Arts has just moved from Montreal, and she's a senior broadcast executive with CBC to oversee all of that. Uh, we'll do an incredible amount of recording through that space, which is pretty exciting. On the web content platform, for those of you that know TED Talks, I'm sure many of you do, we have got funding in place to build the long form equivalent of a TED Talk platform on our website, BAM Center Live. And what that will allow us to do is take all of our lecture content, all the artistic performances on campus, upload them and make them available for free on any device anywhere in the world. Area three is TV broadcasts, where we've got partnerships with CBC and Sean. We're launching our own internet protocol television channel. And then on the BAM Center Press, which is our publishing company, we discovered something fascinating We've owned a publishing house for about 40 years. Um, the last 20 or so years, we haven't had a staff. And when you own a publishing company and you have no staff, you don't publish very much. <laughs> so the crazy wunderkind idea that I had was, maybe we should have a staff for that press. So we've got a new managing editor who's doing publishing and e-publishing, not only for literary arts, but conference abstracts, songbooks, and so on. Um, because we focused on our role as an incubator, it's opened us up to all sorts of really interesting partnership opportunities. So in addition to all of the great programming we have, on, uh, have to date, Arts and Crafts Record Label is moving much of its talent development to the BAMP Center, so that's Broken Social Sea, Feist, Yet Stars, Young Galaxy, and so on. Um, in England in June to negotiate a partnership deal with the Barbican, which is the largest multidisciplinary presenter in London, England, where we'll develop works at the centre, have them go there. Um, the Australian Chamber Orchestra is creating a work in January. I do believe that we'll have its world premiere at the Sydney Opera House and so on. So we're doing some pretty interesting partnership opportunities in terms of growth. So that's how we're going to get the stories of the BAM Centre out there. Um, believe it or not, an incremental spend to build that kind of content dissemination is about $2 million, which is not a lot of money actually. Um, Ten years ago it would be cost prohibitive completely and once we have this built, which again will take us about another 12 months, we'll have more robust content dissemination than any other not-for-profit arts organization in the world and actually puts us into the Harvard MIT class in terms of dissemination. In addition, uh, we want to partner with media part wow that slide looks terrible. Um, various media partners to get the stories of the BAM Center out there. You may have heard, I don't know if this was published as widely in Canada as we thought, that the Globe and Mail for the first time in its history has decided to embed a full-time reporter within an institution and that institution is the BAM Center. So we've got Ian Brown on campus for the next six months as the, what do they call it, BAM Center Globe Canada correspondent. You can tell I'm just, I'm terrible with naming things. I don't pick colors for things either. Um, so that's again the first time the Globe has ever done that. Um, Ian's first job was interviewing Oliver Stone on campus a week ago, which was quite a harrowing experience for him, but he did a great job. Um, so Globe and Mail is where we're starting. We've got meetings booked in New York with the New York Times and really making sure we have the international media connected to the BAMP Center is really important as well. So big upside potential there. On the leadership development side, part two. Uh, we are focusing in leadership development on core areas where we think we can add value or we can move the needle in some important way in terms of social value. Um, the six areas for us are Indigenous leadership. We already offer an incredible Aboriginal leadership program at the BAMP Centre. We're going to scale that up. Um, the very sexy topic, civil service renewal. <clears throat> I'll say it again, civil service renewal. Um, every government in the world, as you know, is trying to reimagine itself at this point. So we're setting up a centre where we're going to serve as the global aggregator, looking at best practices as those social contracts and civil service reforms are um, experimented with globally. On the design thinking space, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that concept, but in business schools now we're bringing together often designers with business practitioners to reimagine creative process. 
Um, in our case, what's really distinctive, and we've benchmarked against 100 institutions occupying that space, because we have so many different artistic perspectives, we can marry 13 different approaches, modalities, approaches to creativity with business practice. So that's a really distinctive aspect for the BAMP Center to explore, and huge resonance in the for-profit business world around that block. On the creative industries, cultural economic side, in our mind, there is not a great arts training, arts management training institution in Canada. We are going to build that at the BAMP Center. Um, we have a huge challenge. Um, I mentioned to um, some that we were talking earlier today, every year in the States there are 400 senior leadership jobs in arts, uh, arts and culture that cannot be filled because we do not have enough people that are talented enough to, uh, to take those roles. And it's not that people aren't talented, it's just the training is not there. So in my case, I have to be government relations head and head fundraiser and head of digital media and head of revenue development and so on. So making sure that some of those best practices are understood and studied is really critical, and this will include training, case study development, and so on. On the arts education side, um, we did not have an arts education division before a couple months ago. Our idea there is to work with public schools in Banff and to flip the normal arts paradigm. What tends to happen with arts education now is organizations like mine have surplus inventory, excess capacity, and we push that on kids. So we decide we have a dancer, and so the school's gonna have a dance program. And the kids that happen to be good at dance are artistic, and the kids that aren't good at dance are not artistic. Um, that is a very limited way to think about arts and culture. So what we're doing is building custom creativity plans for every kid in the Banff public school system. So we're starting with the kid, their areas of interest, their innate abilities, and building custom curriculum for each single child. We're partnering with a very profound e-learning uh, partner who's going to take some of the best practice models we develop in this, uh, with this approach and build a national e-learning platform attached to that as well. So pretty exciting in terms of scale up potential and new approaches to how we think about creative education in the public school system. And in the middle, we've got the sort of sexy buzzwords of the day, social enterprise or social innovation which in our case really is about not-for-profit leadership. So we've got the Canadian Council of Community Foundations partnering with the BAMP Center. That's all 220 community foundations coast to coast to coast building national training um, at the BAMP Center. So we're pretty excited about that. Our partners are BURS, the BAMP International Research Station, which is a station for applied mathematics, 2,000 mathematicians through that space every year. Last year alone, 14 Nobel Prize winners on campus, and a number of them very artistically inclined. So the artistic math or the music math overlap particularly is something we're exploring. We announced about a month ago the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, or CIFAR, is moving to the BAMP Centre, so they'll still have their admin offices in Toronto, but all of the think tank summits and so on for CIFAR will be now housed at the BAMP Centre. And Alberta Innovates, which is our provincial equivalent, is moving to the center as well in terms of their academy. So what's fascinating for us is we end up having a pretty robust social policy framework, big society kind of approach in terms of thinking about social change and renewal, partnered with, I should be doing this a little bit more in a more coordinated way, there we go, some pretty robust sort of qualitative and quantitative research capacity. Uh, so on the artistic side, <clears throat> we tend to, I tend to frame things in terms of fundraising very aspirationally. So we talked earlier today with the group about risk taking, um, and what I said, and I mean this, is for an arts organization, I would rather see something courageous fail than something bland to succeed. And that's really the role of arts and culture in our society, it's not to do mundane, mediocre work, it's to take risks, and sometimes that means failing. Um, on the artistic excellence side, we, uh, our current operating budget is about $60 million per year. Um, we uh, basically looked at each artistic discipline and compared ourselves against the best in that discipline from around the world. And what we found was we're about $12 million short, we feel, on our funding. So if anyone here would like to donate $12 million to the Banff Center, I'd be happy to issue a tax receipt. I'll also wash your car, pick up your dry cleaning, whatever it takes, really. Um, so we broke this $12 million um, out in this way. $2.6 million allows us to move to being a tuition-free institution, which is a big aspiration for the center. So we do not want artists to pay tuition to come to Banff. Um, that's not a lot of money, like 2.6 is a lot of money, but um, as a percentage of our operating budget, less than 5% of our operating budget comes from artist fees. So we're like close enough that we can realistically make that happen in the next bit. 
On the equipment side, um, to do all that we're going to do in broadcast and dissemination, we need to be replenishing the specialized equipment to the tune of about $2.3 million per year. On the commissioning side of things, currently we provide in-kind support. So if an arts institution develops something at the Banff Center, we'll provide stage access and staff and such, but we don't put cash into that. Um, I love a couple things about this slide. One, you can tell I have an artistic operations manager that is very detailed in terms of the $713 at the end. Um, we could have rounded up to 1.4 probably, but you know, we're very precise. I'm just surprised there aren't like 27 cents on the end there. Um, also, this is a work that Azure Barton created this summer. This is the choreographer I mentioned earlier. She is in residence on campus for a month every year. Mikhail Bershnikov has called her the world's next great choreographer. And she had a dream this summer while she was on campus that her dancers were underwater. Within two days, we had a film crew in the pool with her dancers and shot some of this work, which has now been seen all over the world. It's pretty incredible. Um, sadly for me, as a lap swimmer, I was hoping the rocking chair would stay so I could take a rest on the way. <laughs> But, yeah, unfortunately it was wood, so it didn't survive. Um, on the staffing side, Sherry is really overworked, so she needs a million dollar a year raise. <laughs> As you can see, she's got four piles of paper there. Um, poor Sherry, no, so this is an overhead slide on the artistic staff, we're short. And a long proud tradition of the BAMP Center is underpaying faculty. We've been doing this for 80 years, I think. I think 80 years. David's nodding, so I think that's true. So we rely on Banff either being on people's bucket list to get them there, or someone like VJ or VJ runs our jazz program in the summer. I don't know how many of you have heard of him. He's probably the top jazz pianist in the world. New York Times called his album from last year one of the top 10 of 2012. Um, so VJ has bludgeoned a bunch of his friends into coming to the center. But for us, to in order to us, for us to maintain a level of quality around the faculty, we need to increase faculty compensation. So we're pretty bold about putting these numbers out in front of people. I have said to our premier, to our government uh, funders, to most of the cabinet in Alberta, that $60 million were the world's largest arts and creativity incubator. $72 million were the best. So. Um, we will not say world class, we will not say the best until we actually have the funding to back it up. So, and we'll get it. On the capital renewal side, um, this is an aerial view of the campus. Um, there's a video that comes with this. Uh, for those of you that have been to the campus, you will know that we haven't really put meaningful investment into the arts infrastructure on campus in a really, really, really long time. So we have some good spaces, but they're really, um, challenging. One of the sort of funny anecdotal stories is um, when I was at the Royal Conservatory of Music, the concert hall we had there, um, there's no space between seats. And so I came and one of the donors said, oh my God, thank God, a really tall guy, you're going to fix this. So we redid all the seating there and then I went to the ballet school and the theater seating uh, designed by Jack Diamond there was designed for 11 year old girls and I couldn't fit there and they're like, oh thank God, here's someone who's going to redo the theater. So we did that. And the Eric Harvey Theater, unfortunately, is a very uncomfortable theater to sit in. So now I have great expectations that I'll be redoing that theater as well. So next time before I take a job, I'm going to go to the theater, <laughs> sit in the seats before saying yes. So what this shows you basically is our plan is to build a new theater. It should be about 1,000 seats. Everything is really designed to enable artistic experimentation. So uh, despite the fact the seats will be comfortable, the major investment will be stage technologies and really allowing artists to experiment with the very best uh, tech around. A mountain culture pavilion, which will serve as a showcase site for mountain culture, mountain sciences, or mountain film festival. An art gallery, a new art incubator space, art studios, a new Jean and Peter Lougheed broadcast center, a new music and sound building. Um, all of those arts buildings can be yours for only $250 million. <laughs> Um, once that's done, we will take down the residence accommodations, hopefully, and build a series of contemporary chalets across the top of campus. Um, so to redo all the residence accommodations is about another 200 million. So it's $450 million for us to build a campus that really is world class. Um, I'm pretty optimistic that we'll get that done. This is part of what I'm supposed to do with the next 10 years of my life, which is why next time you'll see me, I'll look like I'm 90 years old. Um, <laughs> But you know, pretty aspirational kind of view. Um, because of the role the BAMP Center has and because we are thinking big and because we're building on this great legacy, we're finding incredible traction with government funders and private sector supporters. This is not easy to do, of course, 
but um, by being bold, we're finding we're actually meeting with a lot of success. And one thing I would advise people in the room who are active around social change projects, be they not-for-profit or arts and culture, is in economic tough times, these are not the times to curl up in a ball and not be ambitious. This is the time to step up. And I would say, actually, as well, the BAMP Center was founded in 1933. So arguably founding a multidisciplinary arts organization in the midst of the Depression was not great timing either. So, um, so we, we aim high, we go big, and uh, that's our aspiration. We may end up, for those of you that know Banff, moving some of the new facilities into downtown Banff and using this as an opportunity for us to reinvigorate the entire community to some degree as well. What, um, what you've just seen, we're calling an open source case for support. So my staff have access to that. They kick the tires, they add value, they make changes to it. Uh, many of them present it better than I do. Um, so it's one of those things that, again, this is a bit of an unusual approach, typically, um, the president of an institution will keep uh, cards uh, held close to their chest, but in our case, we're very open with sharing this, which really allows my staff to contribute. It allows the donors and state government stakeholders to see themselves as co-creators, and it allows people like yourselves, if you have an idea where you can add value or you can shape, help us shape this in some way to make those kinds of contributions. So for us, being open, transparent, and ambitious is really, really critical. So. Um, that's about all I was going to tell you. I would just sort of reiterate, in terms of arts and culture, the role of our institutions is to be big and bold. We are living through a period of tremendous uncertainty in terms of changes in our economy, in terms of changes in our social infrastructure. And now is really the time for people who have the desire to make a difference in the world, who have the creative capacity to make that sort of profound contribution to society. So I thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions you may have now. fell asleep. Thank you for that. <laughs> See a hand back there? Obviously you mentioned that it's important for us to consider different revenue sources. How do you find your financial sources? Who are you going to? Are you going to government? How do you get a raw board to give you money when obviously it has other um, priorities? That's a good question. The, um, there's a book that was co-authored by Gail and Barry Lord, who are based in Toronto, sorry to do too much Toronto-focused stuff here, um, called The Arts, Patrons, and the Public. And they talk about the history of arts funding. And one of the things that I regret not having when I was an arts uh, student is exposure to how these things were created. Like we study great musicians and chore you know, choreographers and so on, composers, but we don't talk about how they earned their living or how they did that in any way, really, ever. <clears throat> so this book kind of covers that, it looks at a thousand years of art history and talks about the different uh, key periods. Um, lots of different ways to do this. So you know, for some people they do get lucky and get the government grant, so you still have to apply, you never know. Um, private sector, if you don't ask, you don't get. So it's about asking, it's about networking, it's about fundraising. I said this to someone earlier today. So I was doing a talk recently about fundraising and I made the comment that I've never been turned down. And a bunch of people in the room who've worked with me laughed because I get turned down like 90% of the time, um, much like dating. Um, but I think the key thing with fundraising is to look at an, it as an opportunity for you to be a steward and to engage someone across the table in what they're passionate about. This sounds very strange and esoteric, I realize, but I'll come around. Um, so sometimes when we approach people on a fundraising standpoint, if we are too aggressive about our needs and we don't take time to identify what their needs are, we fail. But if you see fundraising as an opportunity to talk to someone um, that you know about what you value and what they value and to engage in a really robust conversation, that will be beneficial. So I, I think of myself as never having been turned down because I just see the success as having that conversation about something that's important to me and something that's important to them. Um, that being said, it's always great to walk out with the check. So um, at some point, if there's an alignment, making the request from the private sector is really critical. Um, for people starting out, you know, dance companies in Toronto, sometimes it's just work in the neighborhood. Um, we've got great dance companies in the neighborhood I uh, lived in when I was in Toronto, and they wouldn't go door to door, and that's what I would do. Like if I were founding a young company, I would just, I'd be aggressive and 
insert myself and say, here's the value we add. In terms of earned revenues, tons of potential in terms of that. Um, I will tell you one other story in terms of uh, a young artist. So there's a friend of mine who's a jazz pianist <clears throat> who got really lucky early in her 20s and was touring with Diana Krall. Came back to Toronto. The Toronto jazz scene had been decimated, basically. And she went from this Diana Krall tour to working in a bar downtown. We almost mentioned it, but we'd have to edit that out of the video. Um, earning, I kid you not, $35 per night plus whatever she could eat and drink. So from touring with Diana Krall to 35 bucks a night. And I got a call um, from somebody at a major bank and they said, we're doing this high net worth event and do you know anyone who's a jazz pianist who could come and play a song for us? And I said, great, yeah, I absolutely do know. And I said, what would she have to do? And they're like, well, she just shows up and she sits at a table with a bunch of um, our high net worth people and philanthropists, plays a song and just mixes and mingles. What would she charge for that? And I said, $5,000. <laughs> and, uh, and they said, yes, like right away. And I was like, oh, I should have said $10,000. Um, but there are parts of our market that are quite affluent. And I think as an artist, you do have to figure out who you're going to sell out to. Like it's the reality, like through the history of art, like we're always, there's a church, there's a state, there's a private sector. And what I find in the private sector, to be honest, is the strings attached to the money are much less than government funding. Government funding actually is much more restrictive than private sector donations generally, so. But relentless, resilient, big hearted, asking for money. Is that it? Am I done? Okay. <laughs>